Yeah, the Castle Main was just built in uh, 1942 down here in Williamstown at the dockyard, the, uh, it's commonly called a Corvette. December the 6th, 1940, when a new world war came knocking for our common home, Australia, our Navy received a new warship. She was built here at one of Sydney's shipyards and was named after the small town of Bathurst that lies in the southeast of our continent. She is the first in a series of versatile ships capable of ensuring the effective protection of shipping near Australian shores. The, uh, they were mainly built as a uh, minesweeper for uh, sweeping mines and that. Uh, there wasn't too many mines laid around Australia, so she was usually for uh, convoy work. The Bathurst class anti submarine and anti mine corvettes were built as part of the largest shipbuilding program of the Australian Navy. Their construction was carried out by all the major shipyards of the continent. But they're a workhorse, they're the, the small ship of the Navy. And the, because Australia was a, a small population at that stage, only 400 million people, um, we didn't have big factories and workshops or big uh, dockyards. So we were able to build a lot of small ships rather than a dozen big ones. But they built some big, bigger class ships, but not a lot. Specifications of HMAS Castlemaine. Length, more than 56 metres. Beam, almost 10 metres. Draft, about 2.5 metres. Total displacement, 1,050 tonnes. Main propulsion plant. Two Admiralty-type boilers. Two triple expansion steam engines. Power, 2,000 horsepower. Maximum speed, about 15 knots. The water we use in the boilers um, it has got to be, had no salt whatsoever in it. Uh, we, we make our own uh, water in the engine room with a distilling plant. So we used to work in parts per million as, as, as the salt content. You can't have salt under pressure in a boiler because you get rapid uh, corrosion. Armament, one four inch, 102 millimetre gun. Anti-aircraft artillery, three 20 millimetre Ehrlichan anti-aircraft cannons that were later replaced with 40 millimetre Bofors guns. Very often, what armaments these ships had depended on when they, where they were working. Uh, particularly in the Mediterranean, uh, there were quite a few arms dumps where Italian arms in, main, in the main had been captured and uh, they were able to scrounge various armaments out of those and add them to the, uh, the official list of armaments. So they had some ability to defend themselves. Anti-submarine armament. 20 to 30 depth charges. Four bomb release slips, two mortars. The explosive that's in the canisters that you see on the mounting behind me is for trying to sink or disable a submarine uh, that might be in your vicinity, either underneath your ship or nearby. And uh, when you throw these out, uh, when they sink down to a certain depth, uh, they're programmed to explode and uh, hopefully they do some damage to a submarine. Range 2,600 miles at a speed of 10 knots. In these summer days of 1942, the battle for Australia is in full swing. The enemy is as active as ever. The city of Darwin has been subjected to a cruel and intense bombing raid. Submarines are scouring the coastline of our continent. Our country is defending its sea routes. On June the 8th, 1942, a system of convoys was introduced for the Pacific shore of Australia and corvettes are its key element. These ships are certainly not heavily armed and you wouldn't really think of them very much as attacking ships. They carried troops to land them into various places. They picked up survivors who had to be evacuated. They convoy escort. In other words, we were looking for enemy submarines and could deal with them using depth charges.
right after her commissioning, Castlemaine was assigned to the so-called Timor Ferry Service, a program of assistance for guerrilla forces fighting against the Japanese on the island of Timor. But the enemies that Australians had to fight in these convoys were not limited to submarines and aircraft. Everyday life on the ship was far from being easy. You also spend quite a bit of time at sea. These are very uncomfortable ships. They're very shallow, so they bounce around a lot if you get a bit of um, a seaway going. So uh, you don't get a good sleep. It's tiring. If it's 40 degrees outside, that's 40 degrees or hotter inside because this is a steel ship. So the temperature is relative to what's outside plus the heat on the deck. So extremely warm. If you're in a wartime situation where people, you're fighting another ship or an aircraft or a submarine, you may be down here for up to 12 hours. So that is very dry. The machines and mechanisms of the ship worked around the clock while she was at sea. All of the internal service compartments were filled with loud noise. It was almost impossible to talk to one another down there, and communication with the bridge was also very difficult. We have a voice tube, and we actually talk through a, a tube. So think of talking through a rubber hose. It's not very clear, and it's very hard to get attention when a lot of noise is going on in both places. We've actually got to shout at each other, and we use hand signals in a lot of cases because you don't, can't necessarily make sense of someone yelling at you. So you actually then use hand signals. If you are talk, working on a boiler, they do hand signals, this is saying of put on an extra sprayer or take a sprayer off, which means these things on the front of the boiler. That means more oil goes in or less oil goes into the boiler. So the ship can then go slower or faster as required. The noise might have been tiring, but its absence was an alarming signal. Any crew member knew that sudden silence was a sign of imminent trouble. So when that happens, it goes extremely quiet, and that's, you wake up, and because you know that if you don't have power, you're not going anywhere. If you're not going anywhere, you've got a good chance of sinking. So it's a, a part of the world that you actually have in the subconscious of mind all the time that things have got to run. If it's noisy, it's OK. If it stops making noise, it's not. Machines working 24 hours a day broke down often and required maintenance and repair, but the ship was subjected to strong rolling and pitching at sea. Damaged parts were still hot from working, and spare parts were very heavy. So what we do would then would have a rope block, which is a block and tackle, which is a multi-purpose unit, and we'd actually then, after we've unbolted, use that to lift it out. But when we're lifting pieces out, they can weigh 50 kilos or more, and having them, one of them swing around on a rope block in a confined space like this is not fun. So it's quite dangerous. Repairs often needed to be carried out while the ship was underway, but everyone from almost 100 crew members on each corvette similar to Castle Main had several specializations. This versatility was very useful. Those who serviced artillery were always capable of helping their shipmates repair engines, for example, which often turned out to be quite a dangerous enterprise. The bearings on the engines are not water-cooled, so they run very, very warm. And the only way we can actually find out how hot they are is to actually put our hand inside the engine while it's running. So it's a bit nerve-wracking. To do it while we're stationary like this is bad enough. But when we go to sea, this ship would be rolling 15 to 20 degrees either side of upright, plus it's pitching from front to back. So it's a quite a moving environment. So to put your hand into a machine like that and make sure you're hanging on and not put your hand where it shouldn't be, um, and lose some fingers is very difficult. But everyone seems to survive. Here we are in the steering compartment and that, and like virtually everything else on the ship, it's driven by steam. If you lost steam to the power steering, then it was very, very heavy work and that. You're trying to turn 820 tonnes of ship 
With the pressure of water on the rudder, you would need four people and they'd be working very, very hard at it. The orders would come down the voice pipe. People who steered ships didn't necessarily need to see where they were going. They went where Sir told them. To avoid any unwanted battles, Corvettes could set up a smoke screen and escape from a pursuing cruiser or other capital ship under its cover. It's just a matter of incorrect combustion. You know, you just wind the oxygen, like you know, fuel, heat and oxygen. Uh, for correct combustion, well, you just wind a fan in and obviously you haven't got enough oxygen, so you're, you're making black smoke. The harsh conditions of wartime service were supplemented by everyday hardships. One of the big problems with a ship is that we use a lot of water and we don't carry a great deal of water on board the ship. So the, the ship has got to make its own water. But on this ship, you had salt water showers. So you also washed your teeth in the salt water as well. And you washed your clothes in it. So everything had a slight salty feel to it. But it's another hardship, if you like, that people don't imagine that people have got to go through and do it for long periods of time. The crew of the Corvette, similar to Castlemaine, consisted of 85 men, including sailors and officers. The conditions of service on board were harsh, but difficult challenges brought people closer. Crewmen maintained friendly relations. Pick an apartment block, put everyone inside it, and don't let them out. You, and you're living in dormitory, so you're not living singularly in a room, you're living in large areas of this particular ship up forward in the uh, mess deck. There's 70 men on average. Um, the ships are over on, mainly there were 40 men in a mess deck. So it's a 24 hour service, so people are coming and going all the time, uh, every four hours at least. So you have a, you've got to get on with your neighbour, because if you don't get on with your neighbour, you go nuts. two years of the war, Japanese submarines were no longer a threat to our shores. The enemy suffered one defeat after another and left the territories they had previously captured. Now, it's time to clear the sea of mines, our own, dismantling the defensive barriers near Australian shores and those the enemy erected in the harbour of liberated Hong Kong and in the coastal waters of New Guinea after Japan's surrender. Starting from summer 1945, Australian corvettes had to remember their minesweeping training. Objects that look like torpedoes are not torpedoes, they're actually floats, or a piece of floats. They hold the minesweeping wires uh, that the ship trawls behind when she's doing minesweeping, and each of those floats, one on either side, will hold about 2,100 pounds suspended underneath. And uh, they're lifted uh, into the water and out of the water by the cranes that are directly behind me too. These are to hold the, uh, the kites that are directly behind me, that are pulled through the water, to hold the gear down and not let it sink to the bottom, because you don't want to trawl at the bottom, because mines are usually set out of sight below the surface of the water. When you've mine swept and they, you cut them adrift from the chains, you try and sink them with small gunfire at a safe distance. On November the 16th, 1945, after 117,000 miles and 13,000 hours of combat cruises, Castlemaine returned to her hometown of Melbourne. Then she stayed in reserve for 10 years, after which she served as a stationary training ship for naval mechanics. In 1973, a decision was made to convert the ship into a museum and restore her to her 1945 configuration. I think the worst thing that happened to her was in the 90s when we were up at uh, North Wharf. Uh, a big uh, ship broke uh, adrift in a storm and uh, swept across the river and smashed into the side of the ship, which took out the after um, gun up. Uh, you can see behind me. Um, bent all the side of the ship and did a lot of damage. Um, so the ship had to go into a dry dock and that, all that work had to be repaired. At that time, we didn't know whether we were going to save the ship or not. Uh, but, uh, it was done, and um, so here it is today. Uh, 
Well, looking pretty good for a 75-year-old chip.